Are you still walking around with a pager and a Palm Pilot? Of course not. You chucked those with your Laserdisc and Flock of Seagulls collection a long time ago, right? So what is it that compels engineers to deploy this design in the campus network? It's one of the most widely deployed designs and it's also responsible for a lot of network outages. Hey guys, this is Jim Schrader. When I talk about my disdain for layer two looped campus designs, engineers, specifically newly certified engineers, tend to take offense. Very quickly comes a retort that they are very adept at configuring and tuning spanning tree and all the other features needed for this design. And then comes a look of, you don't know how to do this? My experience with enterprise businesses, both large and small, tell me that no one gets this right. Every audit uncovered improper and non-optimized deployment of a layer two design. The problem is there's just too much to keep up with. Over time, the consistency of the configuration drifts and with more pressing matters, it goes unchecked until an outage occurs. This design is around two decades old and it was built for a different area. One where switching was fast and routing was slow. Back then, logical designs leveraged layer two to switch first and route only when you had to. The perceived benefit of this design is simplicity in deployment and an ongoing administration. Let's consider a typical core distribution and access deployment with two core switches aggregating multiple distribution switches that then aggregate multiple access switches. This is a standard hierarchical physical design. In order to configure basic connectivity for a classic layer two deployment, here's a quick overview of what needs to be done. Note, we're only showing the bare minimum required for deployment. An optimized configuration will require far more configuration of each protocol or feature. One, we have to configure each switch to run the rapid per VLAN spanning tree plus protocol. This will greatly improve the time it takes spanning tree to converge around a failure. We have to do that for every switch. Two, configure each of the links that connect the switches as a trunk. This will allow us to span the VLANs across all of the switches. Three, Configure a switch virtual interface and IP address for each VLAN on each core switch. This will allow us to route between the individual VLANs. Four, configure a VTP password on each device. Five, configure the two core switches as VTP servers in a single domain. This will allow us to configure VLANs on the core switches and spread them out across all the access switches. Six, configure all of the distribution and access switches as VTP clients. This will allow them to receive these updates and add the protocols into their local database. Seven, we will need to configure a first hop redundancy protocol on each of the core switches for each VLAN. Eight, on each access switch, add the switch ports to the VLAN. Nine, we will need to configure routing on each core switch to route between the VLANs. Finally, we will need to configure an IP helper address for DHCP in order for packets to reach the DHCP servers. Once we configured all of the switches, we will be able to create VLANs on core one and core two. These VLANs will be propagated via distribution switches to each of the access switches. So how is this beneficial? It allows a workstation server and printer to be plugged into different access switches in different corners of the campus and be able to have direct connectivity to each other. No router hops required. Move adds and changes simply require the proper VLAN on the access switch port where the end device is plugged in. Now back in the day, these were called workgroup VLANs. For example, we could put all the accounting people, their servers and printers on VLAN 10. By doing this, they will instantly see all of the resources available to them such as servers, printers, or even people sharing files in their workstation. Carry this forward for each functional group and their resources by creating additional VLANs. The problem with this is that all of the servers providing files or applications now reside in a data center or in the cloud. So usefulness of this design died right along with distributed computing. There's a lot of moving parts in just the basic configuration, and that translates into a lot of opportunities for problems. 
Notice I keep saying basic configuration. That's because this has not been tuned for the latest convergence around failures. It's going to take seconds to converge around a failure, and in today's world of voice and video, that's not going to cut it. Nor has it been tuned to optimize bandwidth utilization as only one redundant link will forward. The other will be shut down by spanning tree to prevent loops. That's half of our bandwidth gone. We can improve the performance of this configuration, but it's going to require a lot of additional configuration, which adds complexity to the deployment. And more importantly, the ongoing administration overhead of keeping these configurations in sync. Even optimized, this configuration can't achieve the simplicity and more importantly, the speed of convergence of other designs. The final nail in the coffin is that it's built on top of spanning tree. When this protocol fails, it fails in what we call an open state. This means that it will continue to forward traffic if a loop develops. This is why it fails catastrophically. Now, if you haven't experienced VTP losing its database and deleting all the VLANs across all your switches, you just haven't lived. There's a reason why Cisco's own guidance is to configure VTP transparent mode, which essentially disables VTP. More moving parts mean more opportunities for failure. So why would we put in so much time and resources only to achieve lower performance and availability compared to alternative modern designs? So this is one video in a four part video series on campus network design. Click on the info card in the upper right hand corner to access the series playlist. You can also find a link to our campus design guide ebook in the info card. And as always, thank you for watching. If you found this video useful, please subscribe and give us a thumbs up.